Welcome into First Draft, a show about the NFL Draft, discussed by the man who made this an industry. I am Field Yates, and the man that I am, of course, referring to is none other than Mel Kuyper Jr. Mel, happy Monday, the first show on TV. We finally made it here on First Draft. Love Christmas, love holiday season, obviously with wedding crashers, wedding season, but how about draft <laughs> season, Field? It officially begins today. Uh, I know we got a lot of big things to talk about. We got top 10, camping it down, mock drafts, already had mock 1.0 coming out, but nothing better than the next few months leading up to late April with the NFL draft. Yeah, we are now under three months until the beginning of the 2024 NFL draft. As Mel will remind you all the time, the draft does not end in the first round. But on today's show, the first that you will catch on ESPN2, our new home every Monday afternoon, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Of course, you can continue to watch us on YouTube or listen to us wherever you get your podcasts. But we are going to talk about the top 10 prospects in the 2024 NFL Draft. And I don't want to put words into your mouth, Mel, but it feels like maybe more so than most years, the top 10 is a little bit easier to figure out. We can debate and shuffle around the order of the various players, but it does strike me that you have nine spots that are going to be pretty difficult to unseat over the next three months. Is that a fair and accurate statement? It is, and there's a nifty nine of offensive players, and there's battles field at just about every spot that we have not yet really finalized our ratings on in terms of wide receiver position, who's after Marvin Harrison Jr., the quarterbacks after Caleb Williams, right? You think about the offensive tackle position, the, the, who's the best defensive player in this draft. So there's a lot of still work to be done between now and late April to solidify spots, but I think the nifty nine, the best players in this draft are nine offensive players. And then you get to who the best defensive players are. There's about three or four battling for that 10th spot overall. So uh, I'm looking at this as an offensive heavy draft. You're a, a fantasy league guy field. It's going to be great to light up those scoreboards. We saw it in the, the Detroit 49er game yesterday. Didn't see it as much in the Ravens Chief game because of the mistakes that were made. But the bottom line is the NFL wants points to be scored. And this draft will be something down the road we look back to and say, the reason why that scoreboard's lighting up has a lot to do with the 2024 draft. No two ways about that. But let's begin with, with one defense defensive player because there is exactly one that cracks your top 10 and I'll chime in on some thoughts about where you and I differ throughout the show as well here Mel but as probably is a surprise to literally nobody Alabama does crack the top 10 in terms of prospects Mel and there is one defensive prospect tell us more about Alabama edge rusher Dallas Turner. You know, I was a little concerned going into this year uh, because last year, opposite Will Anderson Jr., he only had four sacks, okay, and eight tackles for loss. I said, oh, boy, what's it going to be when he's the guy? Remember, Alabama lost, what, seven of their top eight tacklers, right? Their quarterback, their elite running back. You know, you think about three offensive linemen. So a lot of guys had moved on. And Dallas Turner was going to be one of the impactful players, hopefully, that would allow them not to say we're rebuilding, but we're reloading at Alabama to build on basically what we saw from Alabama and be one of those guys. He wasn't last year. He was really two years ago, but this year he turned it on. Went from four sacks to eight sacks. Went from eight tackles for loss to 14 and a half. Had a couple forced fumbles. What I really like, Field, was the hustle and the relentless approach of Dallas Turner. Evident in the fact, uh, in evidence in the fact that he had 37 tackles last year. This year he had 53. So he got after the quarterback. They like say he got he didn't really ever stop. He was always had the pedal to the metal getting after the quarterback and you saw the increase in production. We know it's going to test well. Dallas Turner put it all together and didn't have Will Anderson Jr. opposite him. Had Chris Braswell could be a second round pick, third round pick, but Dallas Turner I think put it all together this year to the point where I think he goes somewhere in that top 10 to 15 overall. Yeah, just a couple of things to add here Mel about Dallas Turner that makes him somewhat somewhat unique in this draft is that first of all while he is going to play edge in the NFL he's going to line up as either a, you know three-point stance or you know two two feet in the ground and you know two hands up uh, just a, a stand-up edge rusher uh, he played all sort of all over the formation for for, for uh, Alabama this past season right like he had snaps as a stand-up inside linebacker which I don't think is going to be the spot that he excels at at the next level in the NFL but it speaks of the athletic ability that he brings to the table some of the football instincts that he brings to the table the intelligence he brings to the table obviously if you play for Nick Saban you got to be a 
pretty smart football player to play for Nick Saban and play for multiple different spots highlights just how smart of a player he is. And while Lea Tulatu from UCLA, who did not make the cut, but you and I agree, is the most ready-made defensive prospect right now, the physical traits for Dallas Turner are why if he gets drafted ahead of Lea Tulatu, he will be a potential top 10 selection. Because as we know, the NFL tends to default to bigger Faster, stronger, not too many players present a better combination of those three traits than Dallas Turner. Let's go to offense. And from here on out, Mel, it is offense, offense, and more offense, baby. And we're going to talk about Caleb Williams at some point during the top nine prospects, Mel. But believe it or not, his high school teammate is one of your top ten players as well. What do we need to know about Penn State left tackle Olu Fashanu? Olu is a guy I watched in high school at Gonzaga with Caleb Williams, and you saw the athleticism, and I've always compared him to Ronnie Stanley. Super athletic, just turned 21 years of age. You know, the feet, the balance, you see him keeping that frame between the defensive end and the quarterback. I think when you look in the NFL, that's going to be something where there's developing to be done. Those great offensive line coaches, right? The 32 best offensive line coaches are in the NFL. There's a lot to work with here, Field, with Fashion. He's not yet a finished product. I think teams will like that. This was a battle royal, I think, and it still will be between Fashion and Joe Alt from Notre Dame. Who is the best offensive tackle, the best left tackle in this draft. Thought it would be Olu and now Joe Walt maybe slightly ahead, but this is going to go all the way down to the wire. This is one of those positional battle battles. It's going to be fun to see how it all plays out. And who of these two is the first offensive tackle, the first bookend off the board? Yeah, Mel, and sort of canvassing people around the NFL and the scouting community, my general sense is that stacking these two players is going to be one of those where it just matters who your offensive line coach is because, as we know, Every team has sort of a different build and a different style to offensive line play that they were looking for. I think about Olu Fashanu, and you know, there are two types of athleticism, right, Mel? There's proactive athleticism, guys who can run fast in a straight line, cut hard, you name it. There's also reactive athleticism. Those are the guys that when people are coming their way, when they're working backwards, can really hold up. And that's what makes, I think, Olu such a special player is that he's the kind of guy that if they have a six foot four, 250 pound edge rusher who's got quickness off the edge, he can match and mirror him. If you've got a six foot four, 275 or 80 pound defensive end, he can also hold up in terms of power. So the versatility as an athlete, I think, really shines for Olu Fashanu. And just quickly here, Mel, to put a cap on this one, it feels like maybe relative to early season expectations, he's dropped just a tiny bit, but I don't think there's a whole lot of blemishes in Olu's game. Yeah, and I think he's going to keep getting better. And if that's saying he's not yet where he will be another year or two moving forward in the National Football League. So I think offensive line coaches will look at him and say, I want that kid because I can make him a Pro Bowl caliber player on a year-to-year -year basis. I think the teams like the Jets, think about Tennessee, the Giants, all thinking, okay, do we take the receiver? Do we take the offensive lineman? Do we help the quarterback by getting another weapon? Or do we help the quarterback by getting better and pass pro? So I think it's going to be fascinating field to see what teams like the Jets. Like I say, you go to Tennessee. Tennessee, the Giants, and some others do in terms of that great debate. The Bengals had it a few years ago, right? Yeah. Chase or the offensive tackle, Penny Soul. It's going to be that type of thing in this draft in terms of the top 10 picks overall. That Cincinnati, Detroit, well, that would be a lesson, Mel. That, that, that dynamic right there is like there is no wrong choice. It's worked out brilliantly for Cincinnati. It's worked out brilliantly for Detroit as well. These two offensive tackles certainly kind of present a similar dynamic. You said that Olu is going to become a better player over time. Remember, he is still, relatively speaking, New to the sport, he was a basketball player growing up in the D.C. area, started playing football later in high school. As you mentioned, teammate of Caleb Williams, Ed Gonzaga, has become a really good player for Penn State. He'll be an awesome player in the pros as well. Mel Kuyper Jr.'s top eight prospects are coming around the corner in just one moment as we continue here on First Draft. All right, let's keep things moving here with Mel Kuyper Jr.'s top eight prospects on first draft. He's Mel I am Field. And Mel, we just talked about Olu Fashanu, left tackle from Penn State, right there, nip and tuck with one other offensive tackle, number eight on your board. And talk about bloodlines, Joe Alt from Notre Dame, a player that you've known about because you scouted his dad about 30-some years ago. 
Yeah, John Alt coming out of Iowa to the Kansas City Chiefs. And Joe Walt going to go a little higher in the draft. Joe Walt, both tight ends. I think I love tight end turned offensive tackle. Joe Walt, you talk about the improvement and the fact that he is only 20 years of age. Young becomes 21, turns 21 the end of February. I think the consistency level that he maintained at Notre Dame, game in and game out field, was what impressed me. That's why I give him the slight edge in terms of the number one offensive tackle spot. But I think Joe Walt's going to be NFL ready. He's going to be another guy you can put at left tackle if you have to move him over to right tackle field he will get movement in the run game so that's that option that you always have with these left tackles put him on the right side and this is a kid that I think can do a job as a pro bowler on that side Lane Johnson did it coming out of Oklahoma with the Philadelphia Eagles you talk about a kid 6'8 315 320 his father was 6'7 6'8 way back in the early 80s field, but he was 275 pounds. So his son, Joe, a lot heavier at 315, 320, but certainly a heck of a player at either left tackle or right tackle in the National Football League. He just seems so calm and so poised. You mentioned the tight end background, Mel, which I think is still remarkable. I'll continue to mention it for Joe Alt is that just a couple of years ago, the guy was playing significant snaps as a tight end in that Notre Dame program, developing, as you mentioned, still just 20 years old. He had a year of tutelage under the great Harry Heath back in 2022, the legendary offensive line coach for Notre Dame who has developed numerous all-pro players. You mentioned in our first segment, Ronnie Stanley from Notre Dame. I mean, the number of great offensive linemen, Quinton Nelson amongst many others that are still playing at a high level in Notre Dame uh, right now in the NFL goes on and on and on. And for Joe, what I think is so impressive too, Mel, is that at six foot eight, 322 pounds, you expect a guy of that nature to be able to push players around. He's certainly plenty physical, Mel, but as you just saw in that clip right there, this guy can bend, he's athletic, he can match and mirror, and I've used this word before on Joe Alt. I'll use it until April 25th at somewhere in the first 10 picks. So composed, never under duress, certainly helped Sam Hartman this year. Going to be a big loss to replace for that Notre Dame offensive line in 2024. Let's get to number seven, Mel, and it's not often a tight end cracks the top ten, but this is not your typical tight end. Tell us about Brock Bowers from Georgia. Love the kid. I mean, he's probably a field, when you talk about safe picks in the top ten, how can you miss on this guy? There's zero bust factor here. Brock Bowers is going to have a heck of an NFL career, and what I love about this kid, the first two years, his impactful uh, ability as a freshman, 56 catches, almost a 16-yard average and 13 touchdowns. Then 63 catches, 15-yard average and 7 touchdowns. That's 20 touchdowns his first two years. And then he had the tightrope surgery. He got hurt mid-season around October 14th against Vanderbilt. The two prior games to that game against Auburn and Kentucky, he had 15 catches for a 19-yard average and two touchdowns. When he was healthy at Georgia, didn't matter if it was Stetson Bennett. Those first two years, they're winning a national title. He's a key entity in that offense. Go back to games they had to come back in. Remember that national title game when we thought they were going to be challenged uh, in, the, in the semifinal game before they blew out TCU? Remember that game against Ohio State when Ohio State had a 38 24 lead starting the fourth quarter? Brock Bowers was for Stetson Bennett, that key go to guy. Carson Beck takes over. He's the exact same player. October 14th, singled when that injury occurred. Then he had the tight road surgery, came back from that field. The Chargers, you think about this offense, how tight end centric it's going to be with Jim Harbaugh. Justin Herbert, great quarterback, right? Now you get a tight end, the guys you can move around and get those matchup advantages. We saw Travis Kelsey yesterday, right? What was he, 11 for 11? Yeah. They couldn't cover the guy in the first half, right? Well, Brock Bowers for Jim Harbaugh, who has always had tight ends wherever he's been. John Harbaugh, same thing here with the Baltimore Ravens. Tight end position so critical to the success of that offense. And Brock Bowers, to me, one of the best players in this draft. I think he goes as high as I have him in that mock draft. I think he could go as high as five to the L.A. Chargers. Yeah, Mel, when I think about some of the superpower skills for Brock Bowers, there are a couple that I think maybe come to mind more so than other players. One is the hands. I mean, this guy might have the best hands of any pass catcher in the entire draft. Catches within his radius. Catches outside of his radius. Catches in traffic like you just saw right there if you are watching this live on TV or on YouTube. Catches that he is making that are bad passes on throws in which there are run after catch opportunities. It felt like the ball never hit the ground when it's thrown in the vicinity of Brock Bowers. And on top of that, Brock Bowers is an amazing run after catch player. 
Now, he might run two-tenths of a second slower than some of the wide receivers that we're going to discuss here in just a few moments at the Combine. And yet, he is just this incredibly efficient run-after-catch player, right? Like, it feels like whenever he receives the ball, it's as if he has already mapped out the play ahead of him before he's actually got the football in his hands. Incredibly efficient, so good after the catch. Brock Bowers is the real deal. Can't imagine he's going to fall too far in the draft. But what I want to ask you, Mel, is like historical context here. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, Kyle Pitts goes fourth overall, highest drafted tight end, I believe, in the Super Bowl era I think the last time anybody was even close was Vernon Davis to the 49ers out of Maryland about 20 years ago. If you were to compare and contrast Kyle Pitts and Brock Bowers, not just in terms of skill set, Mel, but maybe more so in terms of overall grade, are they in the same tier or could Brock Bowers be even above where Kyle Pitts was? They'll be right there, Field. And I think we always look at the NFL and say, okay, who are the tight ends? They say, well, why don't you wait a little bit? and find a Travis Kelsey in the third round or find a George Kittle out of Iowa in the fifth round you know, or find a Mark Andrews down the line a bit coming out of Oklahoma, not even in the first two rounds of the draft. So uh, you look at that and say, let's wait a little bit. But that was then, this is now. Okay, now the tight end position, those guys that are receiving entities, I don't even want to call them tight ends. Brock Bowers can block. Guess what? He can do that. And he will do it. He's got that great football attitude, that approach that, hey, I can slug it out. I can go and get the job done, and I can get dirty. I can get my hands dirty. I can do what I need to do, but I can also split defenders and be off to the races and outrace defensive backs to pay dirt. I can do all that. So I think when you look at where he does, uh, belongs in this draft, he belongs somewhere in the top ten guaranteed. Where does he belong on the ratings board? I think you can make an argument to field, yeah, third, fourth best player in this draft. And I, I look at the risk factor, and what's the upside? He's got no risk factor, and he's got the ability in today's NFL, if he goes to the right team, and I think the Chargers would be ideal to maximize all that ability with Justin Herbert. Are you kidding me? Can you imagine him with Jim Harbaugh and Justin Herbert with the Chargers? I, I think, and like I said, let's not even characterize him as a tight end. He's right. a receiving entity who can block. So I don't think that the combine can dramatically impact Brock Bowers in a negative way, Mel. I do think if he runs at the combine and runs very fast, like sometime in the some some measurement in the four fives, that could only bolster the draft stock for Brock Bowers and kind of solidify him maybe ahead of either of those offensive tackles or potentially some of these wide receivers, depending on who is drafting and at which slot. But let's begin our receiver talk, Mel, because this is a year with many, many wide receivers and explosive football players tend to emanate from great programs. We've got one coming out of LSU. What's the skinny on Malik Neighbors? Tell you what, and I'll let you talk about his explosive in this field because you were on him from the get-go. And I look at him last year. He wasn't the guy he was this year. 2023 season, you talk about what he was able to do for Jaden Daniels. Last five games of Jaden Daniels' career, he had a catch of over 45 yards. 9 of 13 games, he's getting it done. He's had a catch of over 35 yards, 17 receptions of 30-plus yards this year. He can be in the slot. He can be outside. This is a kid who was remarkable this season in terms of not dropping passes and producing big play after big play, and he loves to play the game of football. I've always spoken about how much of a baller he is, how tough how physical, how reliable he is. The improvement he showed this year was dramatic. You see the touchdown improvement, the average per catch, everything up, making plays, stretching it, taking top off of defense, wanting the ball at clutch moments. Because remember, their defense couldn't stop anybody. Yep. They had Jaden Daniels needing to match points, needing to put up points in the fourth quarter, crunch time when they needed him the most. Malik Neighbors, now Brian Thomas Jr. on the other side helped him, no question about it. Brian Thomas Jr. could be a mid-first round pick. But when this kid had to step up, game after game, field, he did it. You saw, if you're watching right now, and thanks for all, the, for all of you that are tuning in on ESPN2 and also on YouTube, you see it right there. Malik Neighbors had 17 plays of 30-plus yards last season. So his, to me, the explosiveness is what impresses me the most. And you think about this wide receiver class. It's so great now, but I do think this is the most explosive player either side of the ball in the entire draft is Malik Neighbors. And, you know, you talked about wanting the ball in big moments, and we're gonna, not going to try to always lock in on just one play because there are so many from Malik Neighbors' season that really stand out. But Alabama, on the road, opening quarter of the game, Malik Neighbors' 50-plus yard touchdown catch in, when he, in which he runs 
right past the entire Alabama secondary, Mel, and you and I both know at least two Alabama secondary players are going to be drafted maybe in the first round, definitely in the first 35, 40 picks. He is doing it on the biggest stages, and I think also the last thing I'll say in Malik Neighbors. And I get it, we're coming off of conference championship weekend. We don't want to totally overreact to the things that we saw most recently. But in the conference championship, three quarterbacks out of the four have unique scramble ability. Brock Purdy had 49 rushing yards in the second half. Lamar Jackson, the greatest rushing quarterback in NFL history, in my opinion. Patrick Mahomes, maybe the greatest scrambler amongst all quarterbacks, at least of the past 20 years, maybe ever as well. You want players that have some schoolyard to their game. I thought Malik Neighbors really showed off in that regard. Jaden Daniels, obviously, being his quarterback, helped Mel, but, Jaden da uh, but Malik Neighbors had an incredible breakout season. Uh, 14 receiving touchdowns. Actually, only good enough for second on his own team as Brian Thomas Jr. led the entire country with 17 receiving touchdowns during the 2023 college football season. All right, we are about halfway home. As a matter of fact, we are halfway home. Halfway through, Mel Kuyper Jr.'s top 10 2024 NFL draft, draft prospects. We told you wide receivers are going to be coming off the board hot and heavy. We have two more to discuss. We'll get into one more in just a little bit as first draft returns in just a few moments. All right, we're back here on first draft field Yates, And of course, Mel Kuyper Jr., the man who invented NFL draft coverage. The industry now is just basically a bunch of people who idolized Mel growing up. And Mel, we're on to your top five. And as far as consistency is concerned, you've said it a million times, nobody brought more of it this year than Washington wide receiver Roma Dunze. Yeah, Phil, it's a nice way of saying I'm old, right? I'm, no. I'm getting old, Phil, but I tell you, it's nice number, to be in this position. Be surviving, survived a long time, 40-some years. But Romo Dunze Field is a guy I love. He's a guy who fires me up about this process. Every year, people say, how do you get excited every year? Because there's new players every year, right? Romo Dunze has been doing it now for two years. I about what he did last year, this year with Michael Penix Jr., I talked about it all year with Romo Dunes. I kept saying, okay, every game, is he going to be great? And he was. And you think about the national championship game, he could have been had the ball been delivered accurately. He, every game, was five catches or more. The only game against Utah he did, he had three catches for 111 yards and a couple touchdowns. He's 6'3", 215 pounds. You talk about contested grabs. When there's, there's a, basically a dual threat. You got the corner, you got the receiver. And you don't know what it's going to be, Phil. We got a lot of those in the NFL, right? The catch radius of Romo Dunze, phenomenal. The ability to track the ball, I'll tell you what, does a phenomenal job in that area, right? He can run after the catch. He's silky smooth. I think he's deceptive in terms of speed where kind of defensive backs take bad angles on Romo Dunze. But, boy, was he good. Was he special with Michael Penix Jr.? Uh, I was debating this. I had been all along. Malik Neighbors, Romo Dunze. You go to Al Toon. This is in the mid-late 80s. We had a couple wide receiver classes, field. We had one with Al Toon. Eddie Brown and Jerry Rice. We had another with Tim Brown, right? We had also Sterling Sharp, and we had Michael Irvin. Mm. So we were debating three really good receivers in those drafts, 85 and 88. This year we have Marvin Harrison Jr., Romo Dunze, and also Malik Neighbors. Those three were debating, right? We know Marvin Harrison Jr. is one, but who was two or three? I haven't made a final call on this, but this kid, his consistency, week in and week out, when they knew they had to stop this guy, okay, and I know you had you know, receivers like Jalen McMillan, right, and you had J Jalen Polk. Jalen McMillan wasn't healthy all year. Mm, Got hurt yeah. early on, came back late. This guy was the Mark man. Let's make that note. He was the Mark man, yet nobody could contain him. Forget stopping him. They couldn't contain him in the field. That's what impressed me a lot with Romo Dunze. He does everything well, right, Mel? If you think of a trait that a wide receiver needs to have in his skill set, I think there's a pretty good chance that Romo Dunze does it at a, at a very good, maybe even an excellent level. And, you know, this debate about which receiver is better between he and Malik Neighbors is going to rage all the way until the draft actually begins, Mel. That will be my imagine. That, that will be how I imagine things unfolding. I think, Phil, that matters probably just for one organization, Mel. And that is the organization that takes one of these two wide receivers before the other. What I mean by that is if you were to go and poll 32 NFL teams right now and you ask them what their respective grades were on Roma Dunze and Malik Neighbors, my guess is most of them, whatever their grading scale is, if it's you know, 1 to 100, 1 to 10, 1 to 9, whatever it might be, 
is close to identical, right? That's how close these two players are in terms of how you view them, I view them, and I think the NFL scouting world views them as well. Somebody's going to have to make a critical decision between Roma Dunze and Malik Neighbors as the second wide receiver off the board, but make no mistake about it, you are choosing between two very excellent options when you have to pick between the Washington and LSU stars. Quarterback talk, Mel. We've waited all the way until this part of the show to mention our first quarterback. The fourth best player on your board is the first quarterback we've discussed today, Drake May out of North Carolina. What's he bring to the table? I brings a ton of skill. I talk about a guy with size, with arm strength. He's effortless throwing the football at any point on the field. He can run. He can beat you with his legs. You think you have him stopped, and he will take off and pick up 20, 25 yards on a run. Drake May, two years ago, 2022 season, if you looked like he was going to be maybe the number one pick overall right there with Caleb Williams, he was incredible that season. 66% completion percentage, 38 touchdowns, only seven picks, seven rushing touchdowns. At 45 touchdowns, he accounted for only seven turnovers there, right, with seven interceptions. You see the athleticism he displays. You see him off platform making accurate throws. That's why going into this year, Based on what we saw week in and week out in 2022, he could be challenging Caleb Williams. We saw the drop off there. Completion percentage down. Yards. Saw a couple more interceptions, right? You saw him have games where he did not look like he did in 2022. He had time to throw. You couldn't get, make an excuse. Well, the offensive line let him down. Couldn't make an excuse that ah, he was pressured. Couldn't make an excuse that the receivers weren't getting open. He had guys open. He had time to throw, and he was not accurate with throws that he should make. Some layups he was missing field. And I've, brought, I've uh, mentioned those games time and time again. Virginia, NC State, Clemson. Go yeah. back and look at those games. They're head scratchers. But if you go back to 2022 field, he looked like a guy who was guaranteed to be in the discussion with Caleb Williams to be the number one pick overall. Now, he's, you're, we're debating, is it Jaden Daniels or Drake May to be the number two quarterback? So he kind of opened the door for Jaden. He didn't make it a challenge for Caleb, in my opinion, Field. Where are you on Drake May? I, I like the kid. I just wish this year would have been more consistent down the stretch. He would have played a little bit better in those games. I love Drake. I, I think you I think you love Drake May, though, right, Mel? I mean, I, I know you said you, said, you, you just said you like him, but... I mean, he's the fourth best player on your board, right? I mean, we're talking about a guy who yeah. that first quarterback contract for him is going to be like, what, $32 million over four seasons. This is not some slouch here. It's nitpicking, trying to find ways to break the tie or close to a tie between two quarterbacks because franchise fortunes can be changed or shaped by making the right quarterback call. I think the process will be kind to Drake May. The skill set is terrific, Mel. And by the way, the build is incredible as well. Six foot three, 240 pounds. We haven't talked about this a ton with Jaden Daniels during our conversation so far here on First Draft throughout the pre-draft process. But the body armor for Drake May is built to last in the NFL, and he does not take as many sort of jaw-dropping hits in the wrong way as Jaden Daniels does. So the body, the body armor is terrific. The build is terrific. He is a strike thrower in the middle of the field. I'm not sure there's a better quarterback in terms of the deep ball accuracy, the consistency in the intermediate game, and the velocity that you need. He's going to be able to cut through elements if he gets drafted to a team like the New England Patriots, who play a lot of games in crappy weather. As somebody who lives in Connecticut, and every sec second day over the past two weeks we've been dealing with snow, I can tell you that stuff does matter. It was a down season this year compared to last year, which is part of the reason why the bloom is off the rose a little bit, metaphorically speaking. But Drake May brings pretty much all the things that a team is going to be looking for. He's an outstanding processor and a great kid as well. Actually, all three of these quarterbacks at the top of the draft are good processors and great kids as well, Mel. But I think the process is going to be good to Drake May. I would be very, very surprised if he is not a top three pick by the time we get to April 25th. I think it's guaranteed field he will be. I think Drake May, his father Mark, quarterback in North Carolina, scouted him coming out. You think about the, the coordinator change for a quarterback is critical, okay? So he had that. New offensive coordinator steps in. His go-to target, who had like 94 catches. Nobody else had over, what, 30-some. That was Josh Downs, who's now doing a really good job with the Indianapolis Colts. So Drake May, you say, I would have <laughs> loved them, guaranteed, had he been a little bit better. I really, really like him. I think I ultimately, when you got a guy that high, you say, I 
can in the NFL believe he can be a franchise quarterback. The just and I hate comps, but the Justin Herbert comp is really accurate. Field that's the type of quarterback he can become in the NFL. If you love Justin Herbert and you think he can be great, look what Jim Harbaugh saying. I got a gem here. I got a guy. Everybody's yeah. talking about the He's Chargers now being a Super Bowl contender. Now they've added Jim Harbaugh as a head coach. Exactly. So Drake May, if you can be that kind of quarterback, the Patriots. And you mentioned the weather. And his skill set, his size, his arm strength, how effortless he is throwing the football to any point. Drake May would fit in well in New England and really in a division where you have to go to Buffalo as well totally. and New York yeah. and the AFC. And you have to, to outdo all those great quarterbacks in the AFC. Uh, Drake May in New England, because of the year he had, maybe pushes him to three where he would have been locked into two and you wouldn't have gotten him field. So if you're the Patriots, you're kind of happy yeah. that the Virginia game, the NC State game, and the Clemson game didn't go the way maybe uh, Drake May hoped it would. If you're the Patriots, just take the third of these quarterbacks that is remaining for you at pick three. we got three minutes now to discuss your number three prospect, Mel, and that is the Heisman yep. Trophy winner with the numbers that seem fake when you look at them. That's Jaden Daniels from LSU. Well, Jaden did it all, and, and he had a lot of pressure on him coming in. You think about the defense that let that team down week in and week out. He knew, okay, I've just put 28, 35, 40. It's not enough. Now i got to get a drive to put a drive together late. Yes, he did have neighbors in Brian Thomas Jr., but when you look at the ability he had, to stress a defense, and you saw him in the SEC running away from defensive backs, just seeing the field. I think his vision is seeing the field and being able to throw with his eyes up on the move and being able to take hit after hit. He was about 205, maybe field. He played at 180 at times during his career. Think about how thin he was, how angular he is, but he did add weight to the frame. We were talking about a fourth rounder last year, now the second, third pick overall. He doesn't, and I love the fact that he takes shots and he doesn't throw interceptions. He runs. He's aggressive. He doesn't fumble the football field. You find, and I know we'll have to nitpick on Jaden Daniels because last year the improvement was significant. We needed to see certain things. We did. Jaden Daniels, to me, is right in line to be that second pick overall, at worst a third pick. And like I said, no player that I remember at quarterback went from a fourth rounder to the second pick overall and did that type of, of a quantum leap, that huge dramatic leap in one season. Yeah, I absolutely love Jaden Daniels. It's well documented if you've been following along here on First Draft. Mel, all the things that you mentioned are all great strengths of his. But again, the numbers actually look fake when you look at them. Over the past two seasons, 78 combined rushing and receiving touchdowns, and just seven interceptions. And Mel, one of the pushbacks on Jaden Daniels has been, well, he had Brian Thomas Jr. and Malik Neighbors. Hey, Mel, how were those guys last year? Well, they combined, I believe, for seven receiving touchdowns. I get it. Jaden Daniels had great pieces around him. He also made those guys great players himself. His elevation led to their elevation. My quick feedback in terms of areas that remain question marks for Jaden Daniels going into the draft, Mel, is that he takes a lot of hits. And you mentioned that frame. 205 pounds is like the top end of his weight. He was vulnerable to taking some big hits. Beyond that, Mel, this is going to be a thing that every quarterback with this level of athletic ability is going to have to balance. Is that when you see it, if it's there to grip it and rip it, Sometimes the best play is to just grip it and rip it and not trust your legs more than your arms. I will stand on this hill until the day that I die. That is coachable. It does not concern me. It's just going to be something that every quarterback with his skill set is going to have to manage. But we are all fans of both Drake May and Jaden Daniels Jr. Jaden Daniels, excuse me. Coming around the corner on first draft, Mel Kuyper Jr.'s top two NFL draft prospects. All right, back here on First Draft, he's Mel Kuyper Jr. I am Field Yates. Mel, your top ten prospects. We have unveiled the first eight of them. Now, tell me about a man who you scouted the father of some 32 years ago. It's Marvin Harrison Jr. Oh, Marvin Harrison came to the Hula Bowl, and Marvin Harrison Jr., just like his dad. And, oh, you're a little bit bigger, a little bit a lot bigger. And Marvin Harrison Sr. was about 5'11 and a half, 181, right? Marvin Harrison Jr., 6'3", 6'4", 205. Uh, you think about Marvin Harrison Sr., ran 4'3", three, 3 field, Hall of Famer. Marvin Harrison Jr. could be equally as good. That same business-like approach. When you're a star and you're a receiver, are you a diva? No, you're not. You're all business. You're focused every week. And for Marvin Harrison Jr., C.J. Stroud, right? Great year with C.J. Could have won a national title, right? Got hurt. End of the third quarter when they were up, going up 38-24 you know, over Georgia. He didn't play in the fourth quarter. Georgia came back and won that game. That's a difference maker, my friends, okay? That's what Marvin Harrison Jr. was. Think about this, Field. 
CJ Stroud moves on to the NFL. Great rookie year. Kyle McCord is now at Syracuse, right? He had a better average per catch this year than they did with CJ Stroud. Touchdowns, you see 15 to 14. He had 10 less catches, but the drop off, he didn't have any drop off, right? Marvin Harrison Jr., didn't he have a Mecca Buka healthy all year, right? Yet he produced. And to me, that's something that's, that speaks volumes and the bloodlines. Like I say, when you knew and you saw, and I was with Marvin Harrison Sr. when he came out into the NFL. And I talked to Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, this year, and exactly the same guy. And if you, you can't look back and say, okay, the year Keyshawn went number one, Marvin Harrison Sr. dropped a little bit to the Colts, right? Became a phenomenal player with Peyton Manning. Marvin Harrison Jr., not going to drop. He's going to be in that top four overall. If an Arizona Cardinals getting with the fourth pick, uh, boy, what a choice that'll be, and what a weapon he will be with Kyler Murray. Yeah, again, no weaknesses in the game of Marvin Harrison Jr. Mel, I think a fun way to describe just how talented a player is is that when I think about evaluating defensive backs that covered Marvin Harrison Jr. for a snap, a game, or some amount in between from this past season, Mel, I think about players or plays that went wrong, and it's going to impact the draft status negatively of players. Like, he had his way with Kalen King, a cornerback from Penn State, who probably entered the year with a bigger draft than he exited the year. I think about players like Bo Braid, safety from Maryland, who was trusted to, at one point during their matchup with the Ohio State Buckeyes this year, cover Marvin Harrison man-to-man. -man. I think about how that can actually elevate a guy's grade. It's like, wow, this guy is good enough to, as a safety, be asked to cover Marvin Harrison Jr.? That tells you a little bit about how Maryland viewed him and how NFL teams might view him as well. He's a measuring stick prospect for other prospects, which speaks to the brilliance of Marvin Harrison Jr. And just some context, once again, I asked you earlier, Mel, about Brock Bowers vis-a-vis -vis Kyle Pitts a couple of years ago. I think you have, is this correct that you're the last player amongst wide receivers with the grade as high as Marvin Harrison Jr.'s is Calvin Johnson in 2007? Yeah, Keyshawn Johnson had a super high grade as well. When he came out, ironically, with Marvin Harrison Sr. in that same draft in the mid-90s field. So, yes, this is an historically elite grade for a wide receiver is what Marvin Harrison Jr. will, will have. Now, he did have a drop every now and then. They do. There will be that. You can nitpick that. But Marvin Harrison Jr. will keep trying to improve. Like I said, he's never going to rest on his laurels. He's not going to say, hey, I'm great. I'm okay. Yeah, I can head to the beach. I can take some time off. This guy's going to work every day during the offseason to get better. So there's no doubt about that. That's what the Harrison family does. That's the way they do their business. Like I said, his dad was that way from the get-go. You remember coming to Hawaii and you say, okay, I'm going to the Hula Bowl. It's a little more relaxed, right? He didn't want any part of that. We were talking about what number he was going to wear. He said, hey, I'll wear a plain jersey. I'm not wearing Bobby Ingram's jersey. I, I, we got him number 88. Bottom line is Marvin Harrison Jr., that same type of approach. And when you combine that with what we saw in the field, uh, this year with Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, how, do, how do you not believe that this is a, we talk about no-risk pick, that Brock Bowers is that type of guy. Marvin Harrison Jr. holds off two other great receivers in Malik Neighbors and Romo Dunze to be wide receiver one this year. All right, let's wrap up with your number one player in the 2024 NFL Draft. Mel, you have not wavered from before the season. It is still USC quarterback Caleb Williams, the Heisman Trophy winner a season ago, who a ho-hum 90-plus touchdowns over the past two years for the Trojans. Yeah, you talk about loving guys, love them coming into the year, love them at the beginning of the year, late in the year. It was the same thing with Drake May. It was those head scratchers field. They'd say, what went wrong? The Notre Dame game, three interceptions. A couple of games late in the year, Cal Wondos, he's at 55, 57%. He's not as accurate. So you look at it and say the same thing with Drake, the same thing with Caleb. You know, it just didn't finish as strong as you hoped it would. That's why for Caleb, you said, okay, can Drake challenge him? Well, he didn't because of the way he struggled in some games. Caleb has some, I think, I wouldn't say doubters, but there are people saying, is he as good as generational? Is he as good as people are saying elite of the elite? Is he one of the best quarterback prospects we've seen maybe in the last 30 years or right up there with the great ones because of those struggles from that Notre Dame game on that opened the door and opened up the, the debate field as to whether Caleb Williams is special generational elite of the elite so right now I really do like him you say love you have, yeah number one player on the board you love him I would have loved to said exclamation point at the end of that sentence the fact that he didn't have that mid-season to the end finish 
Same thing with Drake May is the reason why with both those quarterbacks, we're not necessarily as guaranteed to say three exclamation points at the end of the write-up on Caleb or Drake because, like I say, they didn't finish as strong as we would have liked. Yeah, the dynamic playmaking, though, is so hard for me to ignore with Caleb Williams. Now, mm -hmm. I feel like every play, every game, there's like five plays where you just think to yourself, how many other quarterbacks in this draft are able to make this play consistently? Or even once. I mean, Caleb Williams' ability to throw on the run is so exceptional. And you needed that this year with this USC offense that wasn't exactly like he was being protected by this current version of the Chiefs or 49ers offensive line, right? And I get it that it's not like Drake May had a bunch of all-star players that he was playing with. Jaden Daniels did yes in both Malik Neighbors and also Brian Thomas Jr. But I don't know that there is a first-round pick in this year or next year next year's draft, Mel, that was on that USC offense besides Caleb Williams. So it's not like he was throwing it to a bunch of stars like he was last year when he was focused most primarily on Jordan Addison. So I get it. They're going to be naysayers, Mel. I do think part of that is the nature of when you're the number one pick. We are trying to find reasons to argue against you. But I think Caleb Williams, so dynamic, so capable. If I had to find a couple of like small, maybe like, Areas to improve for Caleb Williams. It would be something I talked about a moment ago with Jaden Daniels is sometimes just taking the easy play, right? Like sometimes living to see another down is better than trying to go for it all and potentially turning the football over and under duress, which he was a lot this year. And this kind of coincides with always trying to find a way to make the magical play happen. Got to keep two hands on the football now, right? Ball security is job security in the NFL. There were just a couple too many turnovers in the pocket for Caleb Williams. It could have been easily avoided by just holding on to the football a little bit firmer. But it's hard for me to find a whole lot that I don't like about his game. Yeah, Field, and the one thing, too, college football's change. you got to adapt to the change. These kids have distractions. They're almost, they're basically professional football players, right? Yeah. They're agents, they're doing commercials. They come off great years. Drake May and Caleb Williams had great seasons in 2022. They lost key pieces. I mentioned, you know, Josh Downs for Drake May. How about Jordan Addison for Caleb Williams, right? And then you're great. Now you're not, your team's struggling a bit. North Carolina, you think about USC, lost the game, Notre Dame game. And then all of a sudden you're thinking about, protecting your body. You don't have the weapons you had. There's a lot of factors, a lot of distractions going on. So maybe that contributed to what we <laughs> saw a little bit with those two quarterbacks as well. But if you look at 2022, that's where you say define. They were mm. great. You just hope that they can be that way in the NFL. They're going to be expected to be field. Let's face it. We're expecting Caleb Williams and Drake May to be franchise quarterbacks in the National Football League. That's why they're going to come off the board at one or either two or three. So, uh, hey, yeah. we're, we're, like I say, I'm not saying we're nitpicking. We wish we'd have seen a little more. Bottom line is these are two potential franchise quarterbacks. Two last thoughts here, Mel. First of all, I think it's possible that any of those three goes number one overall. I really believe that. I think Caleb Williams is, you know, sort of the, the, the proverbial betting favorite. But if you told me that Drake May – or Jaden Daniels goes number one overall on January 29th, I would not say that you are completely insane. But second of all, Mel, what I will say is there's going to be a lot of pressure with that number one pick. There always is. But think about this. The Bears, if they take a quarterback, are deciding that that prospect is better than Justin Fields. That guy's got to be better than Justin, who's imperfect, but he's been pretty darn good at moments during the first three seasons of his career. Meanwhile, if someone trades up to pick number one, they're paying a big price to do so. As we saw with Carolina, if you don't deliver right away, we start writing coulda, woulda, should you stories on players like Bryce Young. There you have it. The first TV episode is in the books. Mel Kuyper Jr.'s top 10 picks. We appreciate all, yous, all you that watched here on the TV version. We'll see you again next Monday. All right, we're back here on First Draft. A little bonus overtime content, Mel, for those that have hung around on the YouTube stream or are listening to this on the podcast version. Is there any player that didn't make your top 10 that you felt really bad about not including him? You know, the only one I think when you really look at it, Field, you go to Leatu Latu, and we have talked about him <laughs> as a guy who's kind of in that mix. I think 18th is where uh, uh, Jalen Phillips went coming off the board from Miami, formerly of UCLA, right? And he had the injury. And then we talk about Leatu Latu, Field, as a guy I know you like. We all like his natural pass rush ability. He's slippery off the edge. 
What do you do? Coming back from the neck injury, he had medically retired. Then he goes to UCLA and he's putting together these great games. He had a stretch field of five games at midseason this year with seven sacks. He was unblockable in those games. Now, how's the medical go? Like I said, Jalen Phillips went about 18th to Miami a couple years ago. So while Liato Latu is a guy maybe top 10 grade, that's what he deserves, does the medical push him down just a bit? I'll give you one more, and I love Leia Tulato. You're right, Mel. As we say often on this show, as far as the medical is concerned, Mel, like you and I aren't doctors. Every team's going to have a different evaluation of Leia Tulato's injury in the same way they will with Michael Penix's injury history as well. Some doctors may say no problems whatsoever. Some might say, hey, it gives us pause. That'll influence where those two players are drafted. I'll give you one name that is not my top 10 right now. He's my number 15 player. I'm not saying he's a guarantee to go in the top 10. But if you told me over the next three months his value skyrocketed, I would say that adds up. And that player is Tyler Guyton, Oklahoma offensive tackle, Mel. And the reason why is because what this guy is, and not just a six foot seven offensive tackle, but an incredible athlete as well. He'll be at the Senior Bowl down in Mobile this week. Can't wait to see him measure up and also how he holds up in one on ones and stuff like that. He is very raw, Mel, but this kid has a chance to become a special prospect in my eyes. What do you think? It was entertaining to watch Field because he will slug it out with you, boy, and he is a talented kid. Boy, offensive line coaches, when they're down there, will look at him as, again, when you talk about a guy and say, give me that guy. I can mold him into a big-time offensive tackle with the way he goes about his business, how athletically gifted he is. He is super, super talented and a guy who has the ability to play with that mentality of, I will get after you. I will open up running lanes for those backs. I will be a guy who will be a destroyer as a run blocker and with more more experience and better and more coaching. You got better. More coaching in the NFL, right? With the best in the business. He had that great coaching at Oklahoma. He had phenomenal offensive line coaching with the Sooners. And he's going to get that as well in the National Football League. There's talk that he could go top 15 in this draft. There is the top 10 prospects from the legend himself, Mel Kuyper Jr. We're back on Thursday with First Draft. We'll talk to you then.